it's a paper in progress. Well, I want to thank all of you for staying with me. Um, I, as you probably heard, I did a, a, a very fast and brief presentation on the first part of the paper this morning. So I, I will start off by going over in a little briefer detail some of the things I talked about this morning and then go on to what I consider to be the implications of these unique human serotonogic and opioid systems. Um, so to just briefly review what I talked about this morning, there is this issue of a drug paradox. Why are we attracted as humans to things that the botanists tell us are toxins that defend plants? And it basically leads to the conclusion that we must have had some kind of evolutionary adaptations for these substances. And so I'll look at some of the uh, chimpanzee-human neurotransmitter differences that attest to the fact that we did as humans evolve unique capacities for the use of these substances in adaptive ways. And then I'll try to put it in the broader context of the uh, the role of these exogenous sources of psychointegrators in human evolution. I'll look a little bit at the evidence for the worldwide presence of mushrooms. I'll touch a little bit on what we know about the effects of these plants, both from more subjective cross-cultural studies as well as the uh, Griffiths research that Tom referred to in his talk. And I'll, I'll lead this to uh, the conclusion that what the integration of the psilocybin and the new transmitter systems did was to produce the basis for shamanism. And most of my work has been on cross-cultural and neurobiological studies of shamanism. So I'll use that as a platform to try to understand what it was that these substances contributed to in terms of human evolution. They contributed to the foundations of what we can call religiosity, spirituality, communal ritual. And furthermore, that they contributed in some very significant ways to the evolution of human consciousness. Uh, those of you who have uh, looked at the cave art of the middle upper Paleolithic transition some 40,000 years ago are probably struck by the unusual elements that most people interpreted as having significant shamanic uh, implications. And so I'll say a little bit about why I think shamanism contributed to the evolution of modern human consciousness and then place this in the broader context of what I call the integrative mode of consciousness. To sort of ask the question, why is it that so many different things all produce the same kinds of experiences in human beings, that we can achieve spiritual states through meditative breathing, through drumming, through dancing, through exogenous sources, through fasting, etc. And this all attests to a fundamental modality of human consciousness that's every bit as basic to our biology as dreaming and sleeping and deep sleep. And so I talk about this as the integrative mode of consciousness. I talk about its overall dynamics as involving forms of psychointegration of the different levels of our brain. And uh, this is a term that I'll often use to refer to the psychedelics as psychointegrators, which produce this endogenous integration of the brain processes. And we'll look at what some of those adaptive features are. So once again, this idea of the uh, drug paradox uh, comes from Sullivan, Hagen, and Hammerstein, who have a forthcoming paper. And um, their talk about what they say is this contradiction between what neurobiologists have constantly talked about in terms of the hedonistic rewards of drugs, in terms of their effects upon the limbic system, versus the botanist views that these substances are toxins. And they make the very, you know, I think astute argument that you know, we didn't evolve to poison ourselves, so there must be some other reason why we use these substances. So they point to a variety of forms of evidence that indicate that not only humans but other mammals did indeed adapt to using these exogenous sources of neurotransmitter substances. It appears that most mammals probably don't metabolize them in the same way that humans do, and this is, in essence, the focus of my argument that there was long-term evolutionary relationships between these psychotropic substances and humans and that they gave us particular selective benefits by serving basically as sources of what are otherwise rare neurotransmitters. And they, in fact, enhance many of the normal neurotransmitter processes and do so in ways that are uh, much more extensive than our normal neurotransmitters. If you heard uh, Dennis McKenna's talk on uh, Friday, he showed us some very pretty pictures about how some of these things lock in very creative ways into our neurotransmitter systems. 
much of my work is focused on why it is that human beings have ritual practices that enhance these kinds of uh, release of both the endogenous opiates and uh, the use of these exogenous serotonin analogs. So as I pointed out in this morning's talk, I really sort of came to this realization by reading in a book on psychedelic drugs by McKim that chimpanzees will not self-administer hallucinogenic drugs. Once, you know, to find out what the lever does, but afterwards it's like, you know, this does not really work for them for some very fundamental way. And so this, you know, led me to the conclusion many years ago that we had to begin to try to understand what's different about how our neurotransmitter systems function as compared to those of chimpanzees and then put this in evolutionary perspective. So this uh, recent research, the Chimpanzee Sequencing and Analysis Consortium, which is sort of complementary to the, the human genome projects, have been looking at what's different between humans and chimps in terms of a variety of neurotransmitter system uh, aspects in order to understand what it is that makes us human and different from chimpanzees. And they say, well, you know, we have these genetic characteristics that allow us to metabolize many of these exogenous agents. And Sullivan and his colleagues say, you know, it's because we encountered these plant toxins deep in evolutionary history and that we adapted to them in ways that are different than other mammals. Uh, all mammals have these cytochrome P450 xenobiotic metabolizing genes, but we have this particular gene, CYP2D6, that allows us to enhance the processing of these ways in ways that doesn't have our bodies turn them off and eliminate them. And in fact, it not only enhances metabolism of these so-called plant toxins, but it does so for a lot of other different kinds of substances as well. So in terms of looking at this human chimpanzee divergence in serotonogic binding, it really in part has to do with the roles of serotonin with respect to higher cognitive functions. Um, there are a lot of ways in which the chimps are like humans in distinction to other mammals and primates. Uh, involves a lot of serotonogic axons in the axons in the rafe nuclei where we have sort of gating processes for information and there's a, a lot of different kinds of common chimp and human neurocortical systems uh, that are enhancing abilities to process emotions and to process a variety of other complex cognitions. But in spite of the fact that we don't differ in terms of some very fundamental features of the serotonin system, there are these two amino acid receptors uh, associated with 5-HT1D that are different. And I, I will point out here is that most of the research that's looked at the psychedelic drugs has focused on 5-HT2. And I think part of the reason that we've done so is that they're the ones that are probably most responsible for the visual experiences associated with the use of these substances. But there's lots of other effects as well. And so it may be that we really need to pay more attention to 5-HT1 rather than just 5-HT2 to really begin to unravel what these evolutionary implications of these adaptations are about. But as I, I mentioned this morning, this article by Pregnigzer came out 10 years ago, you know, and I just stumbled across it in an extensive online search. They compared humans and chimps and other mammals in terms of the binding for LSD, a variety of other drugs, and a couple of ergot alkaloids, and find that in general, humans respond about two to four times greater than chimpanzees in terms of the ability to bind with these exogenous sources of these neurotransmitter analogs. So at this point, while we don't know exactly when these kinds of adaptations occurred, in a little bit I'll look at some evidence from the psilocybin mushrooms that suggest that this must have occurred very early on in human divergence from chimpanzees, or we would say the hominid evolution from hominins. Um, so there's not only this evidence for uh, differences in terms of uh, serotonogic binding, uh, but there's also evidence that there's uh, significant differences between humans and chimpanzees in terms of opioids. And actually some of this stuff came out about three or four years ago and once again piqued my interest because I was looking at it from the perspectives of shamanism as a community bonding uh, activity, as ritual as a source of um, activities that make people feel more committed to one another. And it turns out that humans have some significant differences with respect to the chimpanzees in terms of a variety of polypeptide precursors and that the, the literature just quite blatantly says humans had accelerated evolution, positive selection for uh, differences in these opioid systems. Um, I, I suspect that it wasn't due to plants in the case of the opioids. I suspect that it was due to the adaptive effects of ritual 
and integrating communities. And indeed, a number of archaeologists have now begun to speculate about how shamanism was basically a tool that allowed larger groups of people to get together. If you look at what happens in most primate groups, you know, the males are fighting over females, and they can't manage to get along with each other, and they're killing each other off. And so how do humans manage to live in groups in which we can each have our own women and not fight over them all the time? And basically, I think it's this enhanced opioid bonding. It's that we let the opioids sort of get beyond uh, what the little head is thinking that it wants to do. So one of the specific things that Wang et al. discovered was that there's this pituitary cyclase activating polypeptide precursor that has emerged only in the human lineage. And they point that there's a, a variety of things that this PACAP does. Uh, it has a multiple fu fu uh, functions in the nervous system as a neurohormone, as well as a central nervous system transmitter. And it enhanced the uh, biological activity of a variety of opioids and opioid precursors, basically by protecting them from enzymatic degradation and enhancing their ability to bond to receptor sites. Um, and well, Wang et al. speculate that this was key to the development of a variety of uniquely human cognitive capabilities. So in terms of the uh, selective effects in the hominid line, uh, Rockman et al., once again a relatively recent study, uh, point out that there's a lot of genes associated with opioid cis-regulation that are key to humans. And I've been trying to figure out exactly what the implications of this, this is. And what I've come to the conclusion is that the cis-regulation means you've got genes next to each other rather than on opposite sides of a molecule. So now they're in proximity for interaction. Uh, but this, uh, one of the implications of the uh, selection for this opioid cis-regulation is an altered a prodenorphin, an uh, uh, opioid precursor that allows for the production of a lot of other kinds of endogenous opiates in the body. And it also enhanced the ability of, of humans to use their opioid systems for a lot of other kinds of activities. So one of the things that happens in terms of this overall development of the uniquely human characteristics is that we get the duplications of a lot of genes. So one of the things that kind of struck me as ironic is that we really don't have that many genetic differences with respect to the chimpanzees, but what we have is the repetitions of the same genes over and over again that then allows them to be used for novel purposes. And uh, Rockman et al. says that this enhanced human perception, human emotional capacities, as well as human capacities for learning. So there's a variety of advantages from enhanced opioid systems. Uh, opioids are significant in terms of the regulation of attention and the enhancement of attention. And one of the things that they tend to get elicited by are novel stimuli. So if something happens that you haven't seen before and you better start paying attention to it, the opioid systems are basically zoning you in on that phenomena. There's also a variety of aspects of sensory motor regulation, or perhaps better understood as integration of behavior with intention and the ability to modify behavioral programs. Uh, so there's some indication that the opioids are part of reversal learning, which is one of the things that's really difficult for chimpanzees to do. If you teach them to do things one way, they can't seem to learn to do it a different way. And humans eventually get the message that something doesn't work and let's try it differently, probably because we're being directed to look at the novel features of a situation. But I, I think that we understand the opioids is really part of this broader mind manifesting potential of the psychedelics. Uh, we can see that they really sort of um, scaffolded out of a lot of other kinds of opioid-mediated capabilities. The basic bonding that begins with the, the mother-infant bond, that extends in the primates to bonding with the group, uh, that in the human line was elicited, I think, through ritual to extend our bonding capacities to non-kin. So I think this is the real leap that humans have is that we no longer use the opioids just to protect our relatives, our children, but other people now were bonded with us through the same underlying neurobiological mechanisms that made them feel like kin. So later I'll talk about shamanic ritual in terms of its ability to enhance this. Standard notions, reduction of pain and stress. You know, you're running out of breath, your feet are hurting, something's chasing you down to eat you. The opioids say, keep running, keep going. <laughs> And uh, there's actually a lot of, uh, I won't have much time to talk about it here, but it turns out that a human long distance running and the uh, experiences that have absolutely, absolute unitary being and other mystical experiences produced by long distance running 
probably emerged uh, two to five million years ago as a byproduct of our unique ability for long distance running. Humans can outrun just about any animal on the planet in the long run, not maybe the first 100 yards. But once you get beyond 100 yards, so opioids probably enhance this kind of adaptation as well as enhancement of uh, learning and memory, and there's a big literature on that. So here's where I sort of pick up with the, the, the new part of the paper that I didn't talk about this morning, uh, dance genes. Uh, Dancing is another uniquely human activity. Turns out chimpanzees can't dance. They can get up and run bipedally for about 10 or 20 yards, but that's it. They don't have rhythm. They don't have music. Humans have dance. It's a worldwide spiritual practice. It's key to the activities of shamanism, and it's used to induce altered states. And uh, there's a study that just came out in the last uh, year by Bachner and Melman and about five associates that discovered specific genes for serotonin and opioid receptivity that are linked to an enhanced dance capacity. And basically, they found this out by comparing professional athletes with professional dancers. You think, well, both of these are athletes, right? Well, yeah, but the people that dance, as opposed to do athletics, have a specific set of gene polymorphisms uh, that in, are involved both in serotonin transport, the SLC6A4, and the arginine vasopressin receptor, AKPR1A, which is an opioid. And they say these two are linked together. So this is another reason why I put the opioid stuff in here, is that in evolution, human enhancement of the serotonogic capacity and human enhancement of the opioid capacity went hand in hand with the emergence of the capacity to dance. And uh, there's uh, other things that they found in their study is that both of these uh, polymorphisms are associated with the Telegram absorption scale, with the capacity for altered states of consciousness, the tendency to have uh, spiritual experiences. They point out that uh, similar analogs found in other primates are associated with primates that have high levels of social communication and very elaborate courtship rituals. So yeah, that's in part what dancing is about. And uh, I would interpret it in the context of excessive fitness, which is uh, based on the notion that animals do things that look like uh, involve risk. So for instance, in, in many uh, rodent communities, the first animal that sees a predator gets up and starts dancing up and down and jumping up and down. And it's like, well, why would you want to do that if you saw a predator? Well, the interpretation is, if you're up there dancing up and down, you're signaling to the predator, I see you. And look at me. I am so fast dancing up and down here. You better pick on somebody else besides me to chase down and eat. So you actually don't have to end up running away. You actually, by signaling your excessive fitness. So dance, I think, is something that is tied to reproductive advantages because it signals this kind of excessive fitness. We all seem to like people who dance very well. So once again, this uh, SCL6A4 allele is a more efficient serotonin transporter, and it also enhances the removal of serotonin from synapses. And then the AVPR1A gene, is, uh, its analogs are widely associated with social communication and affiliative behavior. And then the two of them interact in the hypothalamus, which is a key area for the control of emotions and communications, et cetera. So the, these people suggest that dance and altered states of consciousness co-evolved. Uh, they're not the first to suggest that people who study the evolution of music think that music and dance and altered states all co-evolved as a single package. And uh, there's some, uh, some reason to, sus to suspect that that's true as well. So in terms of a human evolutionary divergence from chimpanzees, uh, there was subtle expression differences in genes. Uh, you have probably all heard we're, we're mostly junk DNA, but that DNA isn't junk. It's useful if it gets turned on. Okay? So like they, they recently found this Fox Pro gene that they say is key to language because they've discovered a family in England that everybody was mute, and they found this Fox Pro gene. Well, lo and behold, chimpanzees have the Fox Pro gene too it doesn't get expressed. So it's gene duplication and the extension of the gene patterns within a single strand that allow for the emergence of some of these kinds of phenomena. So we have significant chimp-human differences in terms of this segmental duplication of genes that are generally in regions of the regulatory genes that are turning on genes, expressing them, producing duplicate copies and uh, provide the basis for the emergence of novel gene functions. When you get the same gene occurring again and again and again, it provides a basis for which new kinds of activities can be uh, produced by the genes. So 
to sort of summarize the chimp-human differences, uh, another recent article that was looking at the uh, chimpanzee studies, increased connectivity, and this will be a, a key issue underlying why I say that we should talk about these substances as being psychointegrators, they're connecting our brains together. We're getting intensification of genes associated with the ability of the central nervous system to integrate information, it's particularly affecting the frontal cortex and the circuitry that underlies what we consider to be the higher cognitive processes. So what I propose is that we're going to find additional 5-HT2 differences between chimps and chimpanzees and that the, uh, the psychedelics ought to be keys to identifying what those differences are. And I know we may have some moral concerns about giving these substances to chimps, but maybe they'll evolve too. Um, so next here is sort of looking at the issue of um, what would have been the environment of adaptation and what would have been uh, what we would call the, the ultimate mechanisms of selection for these enhanced genetic capacities. And um, we have as um, hominins, as hominids, as humans, had to adapt to fungi in the environment, uh, in part because not all of them are friendly and not all of them are fun. Uh, any species that doesn't learn how to distinguish edible from toxic, uh, fatally toxic uh, fungi is not going to have a very good survival rate. So the fact that we as a species have learned how to use these mushrooms both as foods as well as, as McKenna would say, foods of the gods indicates, as Sullivan points out, that we've learned and acquired an, an evolved capability to use these substances as rewards for our bodies. Now how long ago did this happen? Um, at this point, I would say that we have some of the best evidence for the deep uh, worldwide distribution of these substances uh, from the presence of two kinds of data. And one is that basically the worldwide distribution of cultures that use fungi in sacred context. Uh, we'll find them basically on all the continents, even major islands like New Guinea. Uh, the other thing, and I'm a uh, thankful to Dr. Gartz for this, is an article that looks at the worldwide distribution of neurotropic fungi. And there's a lot of different kinds of genuses that have psychoactive substances that are not just associated with the tropical zones that we're accustomed to thinking of them being associated with, uh, but they're found basically across all different kinds of eco-zones. And uh, I find the uh, worldwide distribution of these substances uh, in great antiquity uh, implied by specific species only found in particular regions of the world. So this says that, that there was an uh, ancient divergence of these plants, local specializations, and so here I, I got from Gartz's and Guzman's and Allen's article the presence of particular kinds of psilocybe mushrooms in Thailand, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Africa, and then of course there's many other species that are limited to the northern hemisphere, to Eurasia, Southeast Asia, even in Arctic and Alpine areas uh, such as the Amnitas. So what is the evidence regarding their entheogenic effects? Well, we've known for many years, beginning with some of the work by Schultes and Hoffman and uh, some of it uh, extended extensively by uh, uh, Roche recently, that there's cultures basically everywhere on the planet that when they were at simple levels of technological development used these substances. Uh, they were almost always associated with the ability to induce some kind of visionary or spiritual experience. Um, and there's even some accounts, for instance, in New Guinea, where they don't have shamanic traditions that use them, but when people take them, they do very shamanic kinds of things, even though they no longer have the cultural traditions to support real shamanic use. The uh, objective ability, from the perspective of Western science, of the substances to induce mystical experiences was uh, first established by Pankey and the classic Good Friday experiment, and then uh, more recently by Griffiths and colleagues at John Hopkins University. Um, I think Tom talked about some of these things. They used, you know, controls and treatment groups, um, counterbalanced, and eventually everybody got to be in the treatment group, but they found that using uh, some of the standard scales of mystical experience developed by Ralph Hood, and using concepts that come out of the religious traditions, not out of the psychedelic traditions, found that basically all the individual scales that go into his complex measurements showed uh, significantly higher levels among people who were using the substance in a blind way as opposed to their control period. So it was an internal comparison between what they experienced under control versus uh, the treatment condition. So we get the mystical experiences, transcendence of space and time, 
to all the classic mystical things. Um, and what I think is, is significant about this study is that it really establishes, I think, quite conclusively that these substances produce what they produce not because of expectation, not because of set and setting, but because of intrinsic biological effects. And I know that there's been a really strong tradition in the psychedelic research that say, oh, it's really all about set and setting. There's a lot about set and setting, but let's just not forget that there's also a significant neurobiological component involved. And this is what neurobiology does for us. And then this gives us a context within which to ask, okay, when hominids started using these things, how did intuition, you know, how did a sense of connectedness, how did a sense of transcendence of space and time, how did visionary structuralization enhance human adaptation and survival? And I, I found significant the enhanced positive mood and attitude about life. Um, and this sort of leads us into a whole new area of uh, consideration, the, the biology of hope which leads us back into the opioid systems. So now, once again, we're seeing the serotonogic and opioid systems are in this interactive dynamic in terms of enhancing the effects of one another. Um, there's been a, a number of efforts to sort of characterize what do psychedelic mushrooms do, more from a subjective rather than formal uh, perspective. Well, Marlene Dopkin de Rios published her book in the 80s that looked at this cross-culturally. Benny Shannon has contributed to this. I summarized some of their and other work about a decade ago. People use these things, it takes you to the spiritual world. It gives you a sense of your soul. It gives you information through visions. It gives you this sense of travel to some other dimension. It gives you this sense of powers, both within you and without you, and an ability to access and use those powers to change affect, to change your behavior, to set goals. Uh, it allows you to acquire some sense of powers. I mean, most of us have had some sense of you know, an enhanced power descending or emerging within us on these substances. Um, Shannon points out from his own research the uh, relationship with animals, particularly carnivores. And of course, this also goes all the way back to the Paleolithic rock art. You know, they weren't uh, painting things about animals they ate. They were painting things about animals that ate them. So once again, I think these substances played a role in an enhanced awareness of what was going on around you. Uh, most of you probably wouldn't think of them in these terms, but in many cultures, people would use the psychedelic drugs before they went hunting. Enhanced awareness, receptivity to the environment is part because of the physiological effects on the lower brain. Induction of the experience of being an animal, the death and rebirth experience, healing, and a sense of community integration and enhanced social cohesion. So this is just what people report about what happens when you take these things. Now, my research for most of my career is focused on the concept of shamanism. And I approach shamanism not from the, uh, the experiential or subjective point of view, but I did a formal cross-cultural study, involved societies, uh, some 47 societies around the world, and I took a, a very scientific approach, you might say, formal development of variables, coding of data, coding checks, formal quantitative analyses, to derive a model that says, you know what? It doesn't make any difference whether you look in Africa or Asia or South America or North America or ancient Europe or Australia. If you look at societies that are at the hunter-gatherer and horticultural subsistence levels, they basically have the exact same kinds of community spiritual healing practices. That the concept of shamanism is not uh, an illusion, it's not a, a new age invention, it is part of the deep evolutionary psychology of human beings. So in my book, Shamans, Priests, and Witches, I basically talked about this methodology of the cross-cultural approach, the characterization of shamans, and the difference of shamans from mediums and priests and other kinds of religious practitioners. What I have here on this slide, all of them, I ended up, you know, I was going to go through and just asterisk the ones that were the same as the effects of psilocybin. When I got done, I go, oh, wow, it is all of them. That basically, if you look what I derived independently studying shamanism, Without consideration of the effects of psilocybin, I end up with the, all the same set of characteristics that are associated with what other people have said are the effects of psilocybin and DMT. It includes you know, the interaction with spirits, the, the soul journey or magical flight, interaction with the spirit world, you know, the ability to control spirits and experience their powers, altruistic action. And here we may see another key aspect of what was adaptive about the use of these substances that we do on behalf of others. And, uh, now, even among chimpanzees, for instance, you know, once a, a, a baby chimpanzee can sort of get around on its own, its mother pretty much stops feeding it. You are on your own. 
And of course, as many of you know, your parents probably fed you well into your 20s or 30s, uh, <laughs> so, or more perhaps. So, and of course, you probably turned around and took care of them later, probably, and perhaps gained some wisdom from them. So the idea that we do on behalf of others, I think, is key to understanding why these substances are adaptive in terms of the, the uniquely human capabilities. Of course, the use in divination, acquisition of intuitive knowledge, the use in a variety of healing processes, uh, the idea of transforming into animals, I think, is another key one. And then this notion of an initiatory crisis that involves a death and rebirth experience. So I, I really can't go into all the, the reasons why it is that these uh, capacities are adaptive. Uh, but I note that these and a few others that are associated with shamanism, the ability to, to chant and drum and dance, uniquely human, uh, healing diseases, uh, sorcery and all this, they have these same underlying dynamics. And what I would suggest is that in the context of human evolution, shamanism came to be a set of ritual institutions that provided a context to integrate all these different kinds of capacities and experiences. Um, and I've uh, recently been studying chimpanzee ritual. And you know what? Chimpanzees get together at nighttime. The alpha males run around bipedally. They drum on trees and on the ground with their feet and their sticks. They engage in long distance vocalization that give unique uh, identity to the group. And as the group reunites and climbs up in the trees for tonight, all the submissive animals begin with these chorusing support pant hoots. So within the last year, I've come to the conclusion that shamanism really has its roots deep in chimpanzee ritual. And then if we look at the effects of the psychointegrators, we can see why, how it is we got from what chimps do to what humans do. And basically, it involved this enhanced ability to experience what we call the spiritual world, an enhanced ability to interact in the visual context, in the visual a field with a lot of different kinds of information that comes out of the unconsciousness. So basically, I would say the similarity between the psilocybin experiences and shamanism has to do with the nature of our brain. And in a book, uh, Shamanism, the Neural Ecology of Consciousness and Healing, I outline what I think are the overall brain dynamics that are responsible for the production of these spiritual experiences. As we've heard in some other talks in this conference, I mean, people who have never taken hallucinogens or psychedelics can undergo meditative paths and come to the same kinds of experiences that later they find with psychedelics. So our brain has this capacity. And so to really understand the significance of these substances, I think, has to be placed in the context of the biological templates of consciousness. So one of the things that first led me to thinking about this common basis for uh, consciousness and the templates of alter states of consciousness was the realization that there's all different kinds of ways that cultures use to induce alter states of consciousness. Singing, drumming, dancing, chanting, fasting, sleep deprivation, the use of stimulants, hallucinogens, sensory stimulation, sensory deprivation, fasting, heat and cold extremes, lots of different kinds of drugs, exhausting exercise, long distance running, drumming all night, staying about. Why is it that there's so many different ways to do it, and why are they often substitutable? Well, this sort of led me to think, you know, there must be something common about this. And I was really sort of set and thinking about this in neurobiological terms. Article published by the uh, psychiatrist Arnold Mandel, 1980, in Davidson and Davidson, The Psychobiology of Consciousness. I think it was called God and the Brain, The Psychobiology of Transcendence, or something like that. And he says, you look at all these different ways of inducing altered states of consciousness, they all basically do the same thing. They produce these synchronized theta waves. And it turns out theta is a very unique kind of signature wave in the brain. It is never predominant except in altered states of consciousness. It shows up sporadically in dream states. It re it's a response to the startle. If you get startled, your brain goes into theta. It's like, let's put this all together real quick. Why did I get freaked out here? What happened? And it also is involved with uh, learning and memory. You can keep animals from learning by basically interrupting their theta wave patterns. So what this theta wave production represents is the circuitry that links the paleomammalian brain, the limbic brain, particularly the hippocampal septal area and hypothalamus, with the reptilian brain, the rafe nuclei, the locus ceruleus. So you basically got this circuitry that runs between the emotional brain and the behavioral brain. And it's serotonogic circuitry. And once this stuff gets going, 
stimulating the autonomic nervous system, it then begins to propagate up the neuraxis. So what starts in this lower brain eventually gets carried to the frontal cortex. So it integrates our unconscious into the conscious and then basically provides a synchronized experience in terms of the two halves of our frontal cortex. Most of the time left brain and right brain are on totally different tracks. And what altered states of consciousness do is not only synchronize the frontal cortex, but basically make the frontal cortex pay attention to what's happening in the rest of the brain. I mean, you've heard many times, you know, we only use 10% of our brain. Well, you're right. Most of the time we're disconnected from the lower brain centers. Once we get the lower brain centers online, it's integrated. It fits together. It makes sense. We experience this connectedness. You know, we understand the universe in a totally different way. And, of course, it also helps explain some of the other features of uh, altered states of consciousness, such as why is it that they are so often ineffable? You know, we know that it was important. We know that meant something significant, but we can't quite put it into words. It didn't come from the word part of the brain. It came from this lower system of the brain, the paleomammalian and uh, reptilian brains. So my contention is, and of course it's not mine. I, I've read this before both by neurobiologists as well as by mystics. There's not just three modes of consciousness, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. We have a fourth mode of consciousness, and it's what I call the integrative mode of consciousness, and it sort of reflects these neural dynamics of the integration of the brain processes, bringing the lower centers of the brain up into the frontal brain, and enhancing our overall consciousness. So these temporal lobe limbic system pathways that extend from the lower brain to the frontal brain basically engage a variety of different aspects of our brain into a harmonized system of functioning. And uh, these projections from these lower area brains end up in the prefrontal cortex and eventually from this information association and convergence area extend to the frontal cortex. Now I, I kind of put this together through integrating a lot of different kinds of information and I was really pleased that in 1998 Franz Vollenweider published an article that in my interpretation speaks pretty much to exactly this same model. So I'll just, if you'll permit me to briefly summarize what he says. He says, the, the actions of psychedelics have selective effects on the brain's cortical stratothalamal cortical feedback loops. So from the top, down, and back up. These involve parallel and segregated loops that link information gating systems of the lower levels of the brain, specifically basal ganglia, sustantia nigra, thalamus, with specific areas of the frontal cortex. The loops are regulated at lower levels of the brain in the thalamus, which limits ascending information. So Vollenbeiter characterizes the effects of psychedelics as disturbances in these loops that re result in a disinhibition of the regulatory system of the brain. So one of the fundamental functions of the lower brain is to make you unaware. So until I mention it, you don't notice what your butt feels like, unless you've got bad hemorrhoids, maybe. Okay? <laughs> but as soon as I say that about your butt, you can be aware of what your butt's feeling. Okay? But most of the time, most of the information that our brain has is shunted off. Okay? So what the psychedelics are doing is basically opening up the lower part of the brain. That's why nature becomes alive. Everything that's been habituated now is once again being consciously processed. So he says the disinhibition of these regulatory systems floods the brain upward with information, breaks down the capacity of the ego to integrate that information, and then stimulates the uh, hippocampal and temporal lobe areas and their upward projections, um, where once again are, we have more inhibitory influences on the emotional aspects of the, of the brain. So in general, what I see these substances as doing is sort of breaking down the control of the gatekeepers. If you want to call this you know, disturbance in the brain, sure. But in another sense, it's enhancing the capacity of the brain to do what it's designed to do, to integrate relevant information. And so uh, you may reflect back on some of the slides that Dennis McKenna had on Friday night. I thought he had an awesome slide of the serotonogic system. You know, it comes out of the brain stem, the thalamic region, up to the uh, emotional brain, and then just like these big loops coming back. I mean, this is where our information is integrated normally. So um, if we look at all the naturally occurring psychedelics, um, at least the major groups of one, they all have effects related to serotonin. Once again, to make sense of them, we have to understand serotonin as a neuromodulator that regulates lots of different things in the brain and actually has such a powerful capacity that, as you well know, you take acid three days in a row. The third day, there's just not much effect left. Serotonin is, okay, we are overloaded on this one. 
Let's back it off for a while, and it controls it. So it has this very powerful capacity. I have proposed that we really think about psychedelics as having their effects primarily as psychointegrators. Unfortunately, this term is also used in other areas of psychology, but I think it's an appropriate one to appropriate here because it really reflects the natural effects of these substances and in integrating information within the brain, and particularly stimulating areas of the brain that are key to managing things such as our sense of self, our emotions, our attachments, our connections with others. And so I think herein we find some of the other evolutionary adaptations that these substances enhanced. So in general, we can say that there are adaptive aspects of the integrative mode of consciousness. It gives us access to the unconscious. And um, as uh, Groff's work made so clear, you know, you can sort of pack 10 years of psychoanalytic psychotherapy into about six months if you use psycholytic or psychedelic approaches. You get access to the information, you cut through the defenses, and it enhances learning. This stuff sticks with you once you experience it in these enhanced integrative states because the whole brain's learning, not just, you know, the talking part of the brain. It promotes behavioral, emotional, and cognitive integration. And here, once again, I'm talking about altered states in general, not just those induced by the psychedelics. And it brings information out of the preverbal levels of the brain, the unconscious. So why is it visual? Variety of reasons, in part because the visual brain was the information operating space before we had the linguistic brain as our general operating space. And so visions basically are the primordial forms of symbols. And so I, I think that there's a, in a very substantial way, I would say the integrative mode of consciousness finds a way to exact the dream capacity and use it for new functions and gives us a more direct encounter with our own unconscious potentials. So the adaptive roles of ASCs and psychointegrators must be understood in relationship to serotonin. They must be understood in terms of how they disinhibit the information capacities of the reptilian brain. And basically, the psychointegrators intervene in serotonogic functioning at that level. At the level of the paleomammalian brain, once again, they're intervening in the serotonogic system um, and the functions that it has both over the control of the R complex as well as emotional functions. And uh, I'm indebted to Michael Hernandez from uh, Bologna, Italy, for this, but he pointed out, you know, serotonin is really what links together what Paul McLean called the triune brain. Paul McLean says, we don't have a brain. We got three brains. A reptilian brain, an emotional brain, and, you know, the, the chattering monkey brain. And, you know, you're all familiar with this. You know, you drive someplace, you forget you're driving, but you manage to get there safely. You spent the whole trip worrying about something in your personal life, and you got to where you needed to do your job. So these three levels of the brain can all sort of function in parallel, and it's serotonin that both provides the integrative and the dissociative features of the relationships among these brains. And so I think it's ultimately the psychointegrators that provided for the evolution of human consciousness because it made us aware of what these underlying dynamics of our brain were doing. So most central aspect of the nervous system, uh, I think I've made all these points, enhances paleomammalian functions, and that basically psychointegrators drove this evolutionary process. And uh, basically, in terms of, of evolutionary theory, what it was is that these were the ultimate mechanisms. The proximate mechanisms were variation in neurotransmitter systems at individual level. The ultimate mechanisms were the influences in the environment that made those who had individually more adaptive serotonogic systems more likely to succeed and reproduce. And my last slide here is sort of an afterthought. We really have to think of this in terms of the evolution of the visual cortex. Um, clearly, one of the primary effects of these plants is that they stimulate the ability of the visual cortex to represent, re-present information. So in a sense, they enhance the ability to engage in visual symbolism. Uh, one of the things we know from uh, primate studies is that the visual cortex was one of the most significant expansions in human evolution, and it provides an associational area. So most of the time when we think about things, we often put them into visual symbols. That's a natural part of how the brain functions. And doing so enhances goal orientation, you know, visualization for learning, problem solving, etc. And I think that in a very real sense, we have to entertain the possibility that it was the psychedelics that enhance the development of the symbolic capacity by enhancing the capacity of the visual centers of the brain to represent and hold that information in a vivid presentation. Uh, so ultimately, I think we will have the, uh, 
the foundations to substantiate what uh, Terence McKenna speculated on about 20 years ago in the Plants of the Gods, that namely psychedelics did drive human evolution, and they did so in ways that modern uh, genetic science is going to confirm for us. Thank you for being here.